I don't know you guys, this, this IB bio class. It's like, it's too much work, right? It's too much to memorize, it's too much to understand. I literally feel like my DNA internally is being pulled apart. Oh no. I finally just got it. Okay, but regardless, like look what it's doing to me. It's It's got me like my teacher is, is do this, do that. It's crazy, it's just way too much. And the worst part is, I dropped my textbook on my foot. My sister saw the whole thing. Okay, yeah, I'm done. We as humans are multicellular organisms, but we started off as a single cell and used that as a foundation to grow into the trillion-celled organism we are today. This is all achieved by a process called cell division, which is when one mother cell splits into two or more daughter cells. This process looks different depending on the cell that is dividing, but for this video we are focusing on the division of eukaryotic cells. Mitosis is a division process that occurs in many eukaryotic cells and creates two daughter cells that are genetically identical to the mother cell. There are a few different phases of how this process works, so let's break them down. Before the division, or mitotic, process actually starts, the cell has to do some prep work. This happens in interphase, when the cell continues to perform its designed function, grow and also replicate its DNA. We will break this down in greater detail on the next slide. After that, we move into prophase. Now during prophase, the nuclear membrane breaks down, freeing the DNA. At this point, the DNA also condenses into chromosomes that possess one centromere with two copies from the replication, called sister chromatids. During metaphase, the chromosomes get lined up in the center of the cell by spindle fibers. These fibers connect to the centromere of each chromosome and align them to prepare for the next stage. During anaphase, the spindle fibers pull and separate the sister chromatids, pulling them at the centromere. One copy of each sister chromatid gets pulled to either side of the cell. Once the chromosomes make it to the poles, the process of telophase begins. The spindle fibers break down and a new nucleus begins to form around each set of chromosomes. The chromosomes then decondense as they begin to transcribe RNA again. The division of the cells is complete after cytokinesis, which is when the cell membrane officially splits and two complete cells are formed from the process. This essentially is how you went from one cell to trillions of cells that make up your body mitosis over and over and over again. Interphase, as I mentioned on the last slide, is an important part of a cell's life cycle. Let's break down a portion of the cycle using a diagram to help us understand the order of the stages. It all starts with one cell that is in interphase. Interphase has three specific steps to understand, which are called gap one, synthesis, and gap two. There is another fourth section called gap zero, which we'll discuss at the end. During gaps one and two, the cell is doing a few basic things to prepare for cell division, aside from performing its normal functions. It is obtaining nutrients, increasing in size, and creating the proper molecular components needed for cell division, like specific enzymes and sufficient amounts of ATP. The main difference between the gap stages is that in gap one, the cell prepares for cell division and also for DNA replication, where in gap two, the cell finalizes the stages for division. The middle stage, called the S, or synthesis stage, is when the DNA gets replicated. This process of replication creates an entire new copy of DNA from the existing strands, which is important because when the division process happens, each daughter cell needs its own set of DNA to function. This replication step makes that possible. So gap one, S, gap two, and then the M phase, which is the actual division part we went through on the last slide. This is called the mitotic phase when the cell goes through the PMAT structure, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Once that is done, we have two new cells that go back into G1 of interphase. But remember, we also have this last stage called gap zero, 
and gap zero is called the resting phase because the cell is not actively going through the division process. It is simply carrying out its normal function and not being told to divide or to prepare to divide. It can, however, receive signals that can force it back into G1, in which it will start to prepare for division and DNA replication. On the first slide, we discussed how DNA condenses during prophase, but how does that process actually work? Chromosomes are created by supercoiling DNA, which basically means the DNA is wrapped up and packed extremely tightly together. The DNA as a molecule can't coil this way on its own and uses a specific protein called a histone to get the job done. The DNA molecule wraps around each histone protein about one and a half times before it extends out to wrap around the next one. From there, the proteins begin to condense into a tightly packed structure. This continues until all of the DNA and histone proteins are packaged into chromatin, which is then packaged together to create the chromosome. The intricate packing of the DNA using this method greatly reduces the space the molecule takes up, allowing it to be pulled apart and sorted during mitosis. The stages of mitosis are very important to understand. We discussed them on the first slide, but you need to be able to identify the stages by looking at them out of order. This is important because not every cell in an organism is going through the cell cycle at the same time, which means that mitosis is happening at different times in different cells. Take this image for example, which is a diagram of mitosis occurring in plant cells. Which stage of mitosis do you think this specific cell is currently in? What about this one? Take a second and pause the video to see if you can label all of the question marks. The answers will be revealed at the end. As stated earlier in this video, cytokinesis is the final step of mitosis and splits the cell membrane. This results in two completely separated daughter cells that are identical, aka they have the same DNA. This process of cytokinesis happens a bit differently with plant and animal cells. In animal cells, the microtubules that are used to separate the chromosomes form a contractile ring in the center of the cell. This ring of filaments then constricts to create a furrow or indentation. This structure continues to constrict, getting smaller and smaller until the membrane is cleaved or separated ending with two completely separate cells. In plant cells, instead of the membrane being pulled apart, there is a new structure that is built to create two daughter cells. This occurs when vesicles rich in carbohydrates start to form towards the center of the cell. They fuse together to create a structure called the cell plate, which eventually fuses with the cell wall and completely separates the membrane between the two cells. The cell cycle describes the process that cells go through to divide and create new cells. This process, which is very important, doesn't happen to all cells all at the same time because it is controlled. Cells don't just divide freely. They are regulated and only divide when they are signaled to do so. The body controls this process by using cyclins, which are special types of proteins that inform the cell when to move to the next phase, or to not move on at all. The basic gist of this is that these cyclin proteins, when they are created, will bond to another molecule called a CDK, or cyclin-dependent kinase. When the CDK becomes activated, it can phosphorylate another protein molecule, which means it literally adds a phosphate group to it, making that molecule activated. This molecule will then go on and perform an action that allows the cell to complete a stage of the cell cycle. So cells can regulate this process by creating specific cyclins at specific times. We can see peak levels of cyclins at different points in the cell cycle, meaning they are regulating it. On the last slide, we talked about how cyclins help regulate the cell cycle. But what happens if this regulation process does not work properly? The basic idea is that if the cell cycle process is not regulated and told when to stop or slow down, cells will just continue to divide uncontrollably with no restriction. This means the cell is cancerous. 
A cancerous cell will continue to divide out of control, creating a structure called a primary tumor, which is a group of cancer cells within an area of uncontrolled growth. In some cases, some of these cells can break off of the primary tumor and move to a new location in the body. Because they are cancer cells, they will continue to divide without limit and create new tumor locations around the body, which are called secondary tumors. We call this spreading of cancer cells metastasis. But how does this happen? How can cells become cancerous in the first place? There are many different specific answers to this question, but we will focus on mutagens and oncogenes for our scope in IB. A mutagen is a cancer-causing agent that alters the DNA of an organism. They can be biological, like a virus, chemical, like arsenic, or physical, like x-rays or UV radiation. All of these components have the ability to alter a cell's DNA, causing a mutation. An oncogene is a specific gene within the human genome that has the potential to cause cancer. The two main categories of these genes are tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes. Tumor suppressor genes help slow down the cell cycle and stop it if necessary, while proto-oncogenes help stimulate the cell cycle and help the cell move to the next stage. You can see how these two genes work together to keep the cycle regulated, as one speeds up the process while the other slows it down. If a mutagen were to alter the DNA of these genes, it could potentially alter that process. This means that some tumor suppressor genes might not work properly because of a mutation, meaning they can no longer slow down the cell cycle. Or some proto-oncogenes are altered, causing an increased expression in the gene, meaning the cell is constantly being told to move to the next stage of the cycle. In either case, the cell is not receiving a normal signal and can become cancerous. When talking about cancer, it is common to bring up the instances of lung cancer and the correlation between smoking cigarettes. Cigarettes and cigarette smoke contain thousands of chemicals, and some of those chemicals are known to be carcinogenic which means they are chemicals that can cause cancer by altering the DNA within cells, aka a mutagen. Many studies have found that there is a strong correlation between lung cancer and smoking, so much so that around 90% of all lung cancer occurrences are attributed to tobacco use. In large populations, the more people smoke, the more lung cancer is present. 